We're going to the book of 1 Corinthians in your Bibles. My plan is to uh, go through the first four chapters so uh, you have an idea. Uh, we're condensing some of the other. We'll be doing uh, probably two, chap uh, two messages out of chapter 3. When we did the book, we did four messages out of chapter 3. So if you would like a little more detail... You can stop by Sound Words and uh, they can give you some uh, help on uh, if you want to uh, pursue a little more of the detail. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. Uh, that's where we get the letter, 1 Corinthians. This is his first letter. We have 2 Corinthians. We have two letters, at least that have been preserved for us written to the church at Corinth, and they're both larger letters. And so it becomes a church of uh, some importance and significance down to today because of what is recorded in the uh, New Testament scriptures. Uh, Paul began in chapter 1, if you want to go back there, in verse 2, he's writing to the church of God, which is at Corinth. To those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling. And so we want to keep it before us because we think of the letter, first letter particularly to the Corinthians, as filled with problems. There's trouble, there's difficulties in the church. Sometimes Paul wonders, did I labor in vain among you? I mean, uh, one problem after another. But important that we keep in mind the opening nine verses or so of this letter, he's writing to the church, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. They are saints by calling. Those that God has set apart for himself by faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Um, well, by the time we get to verse 10 and through chapter 4, He's going to talk about the divisions and the conflicts in the church. And then he'll get into other problems and conflicts. But we want to be clear that we're talking about people who are believers in Jesus Christ. Now, within the church, Paul will recognize there may be unbelievers. Well, he may have to scratch his head and say, you know, I wonder sometimes whether I labored in vain among you. Um, it's, you don't know. But he is writing, they are basically the church of God, sanctified in Christ Jesus. Um, so he's writing to correct behavior among believers primarily. Um, in verses 4 through 9, he gave thanks for all that God has done for them in Christ. They, in verse 5, in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and on all knowledge. Verse 7, so that you are not lacking in any gift. And you're waiting eagerly for the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he'll confirm you, verse 8, to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful to whom you were called into fellowship with his son. I mean, this is a true church. There may be unbelievers in it, but by and large, Paul is writing to them as a group of professing believers who comprise the church at Corinth. And yet, as I mentioned in verses 10 and following, he has to go into the problems and the conflicts. Uh, they have divided over their favorite person or their favorite teacher. Um, verse 12 of chapter 1, I say this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. I mean, this division over teaching and teachers and, well, I like this person, I like Apollos. He and Apollos followed Paul at Corinth in Acts chapter 18. Paul established the church at Corinth. Then upon his leaving, Apollos shortly came and took up the ministry at Corinth. The latter part of Acts chapter 8, that's fine, that's wonderful. But it shouldn't take attention off, oh boy, think about Paul, think about Apollos. No, think about Jesus Christ and what he has done for us 
And as Paul is going to make clear as we look into chapter 3, we're just servants. You don't focus on the servant. You focus on the one that they serve, the master. Uh, The end of chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolish to him, foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. I mean, it takes the work of the Spirit in the life of the believer to enable him to understand and properly apply the Word of God to his life. The natural man, the soulish man, the man without the Spirit doesn't understand. He may be very intelligent, humanly speaking. He may have great knowledge and write about the Scriptures, but he doesn't have true understanding of the word of God. And so the natural man doesn't accept the thing of the spirit of God. Paul wants to make clear because the danger of the church at Corinth, the danger facing the church today in the United States, to focus at where we are, is that we think, well, we become more like the world. We adjust and fit and then we're successful. And we really realize we're in two different realms, two different worlds. Um, We're in the natural world and we have the spirit world. We live in a natural world, but we are a spiritually controlled people. And that makes all the difference in the world. He who is spiritual appraises all things, but he is appraised by no one. Who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? Verse 16, we have the mind of Christ. That does not cause us to exalt in ourselves and promote ourselves. It is a humbling thing to remind ourselves that it's the work of the Spirit of God in our life that gives us an appreciation and an understanding of the things of God. But chapter 3 opens up. I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as the men of flesh, as to infants, in Christ. Um, there's a problem. The problem at the church of Corinth is not with what God has done in the life of a Corinthian believer in Jesus Christ, but the believer's response and submissiveness to the Spirit of God and his directing in their life. I could not speak to you as to spiritual men. Um, And we just saw he's writing to them as the church of Jesus Christ. Verse 12 of chapter 2 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we might know the things freely given to us by God. You can sit in this church, you can attend it from the time you were little to you're grown up, and really not know and understand the truth of God. The natural man, the man apart from the work of the Spirit, doesn't understand the things of the Spirit of God. Oh, you know, there's a general agreement, but really understanding and from within a recognition of the truth The things of the Spirit of God basically are foolishness to the world. We see more and more of it displayed, again, limiting it just to our country for now. Uh, More a rejection of the things of God, the role of man and a woman. Uh, The truth of the Word of God as the authority. It becomes more, as it becomes more general, it becomes more acceptable to be more open in our display of the rejection of the things of God. And if you want to bring up God, you are out of line because that's your own personal conviction. Keep it to yourself. Oh, uh, That's not new. 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote the letter to the Corinthians reminding them that the things of the Spirit of God are foolishness. He cannot understand them. Now, a believer has the Spirit of God. We have the mind of Christ, verse 16. Uh, The Spirit of God dwells in us. But then chapter 3, as we have it, opens up and says, I couldn't speak to you as spiritual men. So he's drawing a distinction. He doesn't call them the 
uh, unspiritual, those without the spirit, but they're believers, but they're stuck in their infancy. I couldn't speak to you as to spiritual men, uh, but as to men of flesh, as infants in Christ. That's where we are, carnal. We get uh, the word, uh, Greek word, but we get the word carnal uh, from the Latin, but it's the fleshly. I couldn't speak to you as spiritual men, but as the men of flesh, uh, infants in Christ. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about those who don't have the spirit at all now, but I'm talking about those who have the spirit, but they're not functioning in a way that's consistent and develops the person. Uh, I speak to you as men of flesh. Um, your infants in Christ, you're self-focused. This is what a baby does. You know, he's truly human, but he's an infant. He cries when he doesn't get his way. He cries when he wants this. There's a developing process. It's another area where we don't take the scripture as our authority for the training and developing of young people. Uh, but spiritually, the analogy fits very clearly. I, uh, five years earlier, Paul had established this church. So that's only five years old. Most of you have been believers, just looking out over the audience, over five years. But he's saying you ought to be a lot farther along in five years than you are. You ought to be submissive to the Spirit, and you're not. Uh, something's wrong. I'm writing to you as fleshly men, um, infants in Christ. In other words, you've been born in the family, but you haven't grown. You haven't developed as you should. That's what he's talking about when he talks about a carnal Christian. We're talking about people who are infants when they ought to have grown beyond that. It's one thing when, oh, I just trusted Christ a week and a half ago. We're excited for you. We're glad. Uh, you grow. But after a year, there ought to be some indication of the growth. Two years, three years, four years, five years. Um, this is preserved for us in the word of God because it's a reminder to us as a church. It doesn't matter that we've been in existence for 50, 60 years. Are we functioning like men of flesh? As infants in Christ, I want my way. This is how I see it. Many years ago, I couldn't help but think about it as I uh, worked through this passage I set aside a week because we were having a conflict as a church and uh, it was going to cause a division. It was many years ago. And people came in. They made an appointment with my secretary and they came in through the week, through the morning, day, evenings. All week long, people came in. But they always started to say, now this is not doctrinal. This is not about the teaching. We're in agreement with that. And I couldn't help but think of this uh, letter to Paul to the Corinthians. Well, it's not about doctrine. It's not about the teaching. But somehow, we want our way, my way. And it causes conflict. It causes division, as it did in the church at Corinth. So Paul says, I responded to where you were spiritually. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Indeed, you're not able to receive it now. Now, the ultimate teacher is the Spirit of God. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the basics of the gospel. And the basics of the gospel are foundational to everything. It's sort of uh, the analogies I had written down in my notes was the alphabet. It's fine. You know, you learn the alphabet. Well... You build on that. You don't just disregard it because the ABC, so to speak, you know, they make up words and the words make up sentences and sentences make up paragraphs and on it goes. Um, but there's something wrong if you're just stuck with the ABCs kind of thing. And we know that there may be something that is uh, so worked physically in a 
uh, infant that they don't develop. And they just learn basics. We say, but, you know, that's not normal. That's not what is good. And uh, when spiritually it happens, there's something wrong in the church. There's something wrong in the church at Corinth. That church that God had called, set us apart for himself, had given all the spiritual gifts necessary, and yet Paul has to say, I couldn't write to you as spiritual men. As a church that is under the control of the Spirit of God and is maturing and growing as God intends it to grow. Uh, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you're not able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not able. You are still fleshly. We have this problem. I'm not growing. I'm not maturing. Uh, I'm all about me and how I understand it. What I, oh, wait a minute. We do have the Holy Spirit, each one of us. But then God has put us together in a body, in a fellowship of believers Uh, And the basics of the gospel do not change. But our understanding of that, uh, if you've been a believer for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you understand, yeah, it's still the basics of placing your faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. And we rejoice in that. But then there is a development that continues to grow and mature. Again, using perhaps the alphabet as an example, as a baby, as an example. It's still, you know, the milk is fine, yeah, but you have got to grow beyond that and develop and mature. Um, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food. You weren't yet able to receive it. The problem is you're not now yet able to receive it. It's been five years. I got to go back to the ABCs. He did that in the first two chapters. He took them back to the gospel, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 18, verse 17. Now, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. For the word of cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So the message of the cross, we got to stay focused on this and develop here and mature. Um, chapter 2, verse 2, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Well, well Paul, you just, that's part of the problem. You just stuck with baby. No, but everything flows out of that. You're a mature believer now. You've been a believer for 30 years, but it's not that the death of Christ on the cross is any less significant. It has grown. You see it as permeating every area of life. Every decision I make, every action I make. I'm not on my own. God has saved me and placed me part of a body. Um, They were, oh, well, now I know. And I really like Paul, as he's going to go on in chapter 3, verse 5, verse 4, verse 5. Well, I'm of a pause. Well, they really, I really, you missed the point. Uh, Apollos probably had his own a uh, little twist on the way he presented it compared to Paul, but they weren't presenting different truth. And the Corinthians were stuck at infancy. Uh, that's always, an, almost always a negative in Paul. He talks about the childhood. That's fine. We're growing. We're all growing. Uh, if you've been a believer for five years, that's fine. You're not as mature probably or I hope not, as a believer who's been a believer for 25 years. Um, But the infant state uh, denotes a, there's something wrong. You're not developing any longer. You're focused in on your own selfish. You are still fleshly. Uh, Carnal, we get it. Uh, There is jealousy and strife among you. Are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? Um, we won't turn there, but Galatians chapter 5, verse 20 mentions these two things, jealousy and strife. Those are marks of an unregenerate person. Now I've got this mixture. 
I've got the truth of Christ died on the cross, but now I've got my own selfish selfness. And Paul said, there's jealousy and strife among you. Are you not still fleshly? Are you not fleshly? You're still fleshly. You're walking like mere men. Something's wrong. You're to be walking, what, by the Spirit now. And something's drastically wrong. Uh, We want to take this to heart because this is written to the church at Corinth, to those who are saints by calling. And yet, they're not meshing together. You're still fleshly. Uh, how do you? There's jealousy and strife among you. There's conflict. There's disagreement. This is why I used the example early on of people uh, years ago. But it's been a whole week, and you just start out almost every time. Well, this is not about doctrine. This is not about the teaching. Well, then it's jealousy and strife. I mean, what's what's the division among the church at Corinth over? If it's not about doctrine, but it is about doctrine. And really, it does come to be doctrine because we're back to Christ is not the focus of what we're uh, dealing with here. Uh, Are you not walking like men? I mean, you... Have the Spirit, you claim to have the Spirit, you claim the Spirit's working in your life, but you have fractions, divisions, conflicts, not over doctrine. Although when you get down to it, it is a doctrinal issue. Because if you have jealousy and strife, well, that's a doctrinal issue. Because we shouldn't have it as believers. Um, So let's call it like it is. And that's what the Spirit of God directs Paul to do. You are still fleshly. These are the same people that, you know, we read about in chapter 1, verse 2. I'm writing to the church of God, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Saints by calling Verse 5 of chapter 1, and everything you were enriched in him and all speech and all knowledge. Um, Verse 9, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son. And on it goes. And then we're only a little bit into this letter. And he says, you're still fleshly. Um, That's why Paul and some of his writings will say, you know, I, I don't know. Where are you really spiritually? Uh, You're still fleshly. Since there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like men? I mean, you're walking, you're living like you don't have the spirit, but you claim to have the spirit. And I believe that God has done a work in your life. Um, Well, what's the evidence? Let's, Let's have something concrete here. I mean, I expect you to, you know, if you're going to tell me I'm fleshly and I'm walking like a man, well, here, verse 4. When one says, I am of Paul, and another says, I am of Apollos, are you not like mere men? Are you like men? Paul, Apollos. Uh, I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. Well, that's part of it. I uh, you know, I, I, I just think Paul, Paul was my man. You know, he was a, this, a, well, you know, I really like Apollos. He, he was the guy and he, oh, wait a minute. Uh, when you say, one says, I am a Paul, another of I am a Paul, so you're not like merely men. I take it Paul and Apollos were different. Apollos was, a, uh, Paul acknowledges, sometimes he's uh, criticized for his, ineptness in speech and Apollos was maybe more polished but that's not what it's about uh, so you've got to deal here and we're dealing with what we call carnal Christians now carnal Christians aren't people that just you know they're they profess to have been saved but you know for years I've looked there's no fruit in their life or anything that's not a carnal Christian 
Carnal Christian is one who does have evidence of the Spirit's work in their life, like the Corinthians. Again, we won't go back to chapter 1, but you read, and yeah, there's evidence in the Corinthians that the God has done a work in them. But there's evidence that they've stalled, they're stuck uh, in their spiritual infancy. And they're taken up with, oh, I just love Apollos. Boy, if you, I wish you could hear Apollos, because Apollos, Paul, he was all right, but nobody liked Apollos. Or nobody like Peter as it's going to go on. And oh, wait a minute. Again, we've lost sight of who is the focus here. Jesus Christ. He is the focus. So verse 4, when he says, I am of Paul. Another, I am of Apollos. And I unite the mere men. Now we come to the letter to, this, uh, letter to the Corinthians, the first letter, just focusing on it. We have many doctrinal issues to deal with. We have mentioned, I mentioned earlier, the role of men and women. Um, the communion service, and on it goes. There's all kind of doctrine that he has to straighten out. But the real problem is they've lost their focus on what really matters. And so it's my opinion about this, my like or dislike about this person or that person, my view of this or that. The doctrines are grounded. They don't change. Uh, Paul has to correct that. But part of the problem is They've gotten twisted. I did, Paul doesn't say Apollos is teaching anything different than he taught or Peter. But it indicates a uh, carnality, a fleshliness, that that's what determines whether something is acceptable or not. One, verse 4, one says, I am of Paul, another, I am of Apollos. Are you not men, mere men? Uh, you know, uh, there is to be a unity in the church. Uh, there is to be a harmony in the church. That's why God has appointed elders. Um, Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, addressing the elders of the church at Ephesus, to shepherd the church of God, uh, which he purchased with his own blood. I mean, you know, there is to be a unity of harmony. We get, well, it's not doctrinal. This is why I use the example. When people say, well, it's not doctrinal, what are we talking about? How can I resolve this? You don't like this person. You like this person. You don't like this person. You like this person. What's the doctrine here? Um, you know, I sometimes think, well, people just don't want to get into, you know, a debate over doctrine. But that's what they, is there a doctrinal issue at stake here? And usually when people I've talked to, well, it's not over doctrine. They don't want to get involved in that. Why? Because we'll just go to the Word and find out what the doctrine is. If it's not doctrinal, quit making an issue over it and get on with your life. It doesn't mean you agree with everything, but I don't agree with what they wear there. I don't agree with how they do this. I don't. Who cares? But the doctrine does matter. Truth does matter. I mean, Paul's going to get into this. I just used the example of uh, the male and female roles. Paul's going to get into that. He's going to tell the women to be quiet. I don't allow the women to talk. Uh, there's a whole, we just try to um, put that into perspective and function accordingly. Uh, we don't have women teaching the classes. Um, well, by the way, it's not a doctrine. But they end up at a church where they do have, for example, if he left the church at Corinth and went to a church, he goes, what, what? Well, it's not doctrinal. Well, what? And then I meet people that have been here. I can, I'm winding down so I can just say what I want to say. <laughs> and Jesse has to try to put it all back together again. That's just his role. But I always say, oh, yeah, well, we go to this church, and then they want to tell me what's doctrinally wrong with the church they're going to. Oh, what are you going there for? Why did you leave Indian Hills? Well, I, you, I didn't agree with this. Well, was it doctrinal? Well, it wasn't doctrinal. But blah, 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 blah. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. 
don't function like you're just men. You have the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God will direct you according to the Word of God. So what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Two examples. Because Apollos followed Paul. Again, you can read it in Acts chapter 18. We won't take the time to go there. Paul left, had to leave. He, you know, had his own conflicts and uh, opposition to him. But uh, he established a church at Corinth. And then Apollos came and uh, ministered the word after Paul had moved on. And somehow you had people, oh, I really like Paul. I wish we had him back. Oh, I really, I'm a Paulist, man. He really is clear. Wait a minute. The doctrine doesn't change. What is the truth? I don't care whether Paul wore this kind of robe or Apollos wore that kind of robe or Apollos was a more fluent speaker and Paul was a little bit choppy. Or it's, That's not what matters. So what then is Apollos? What is Paul? And here you got to mark this. Servants through whom you believed. As the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Um, oh, wait a minute. Why are we gathered around the servants? The servants come to point us to the master. Uh, what is Paul? What is Apollos? Servants. Apollos and Paul are simply servants. Um, somehow the church at Corinth had been, I'm, an, I'm a Paul man. I'm an Apollos man. And later Paul will say, I used that as an example, used Apollos and myself as examples. But the point is they divided among who they liked and who they didn't like, not on the doctrine. They're servants. Um, you know, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Uh, down in verse 10, Paul will say, according to the grace of God which was given me. So it's back to, it's not about me, it's God's grace that enabled me to do so. I laid a foundation, others build on it. It's the same grace God in his grace gifts has given men to function differently. That's fine. But he hasn't given any man to say, well, that's me. I'm, I know I know about this. I know that I'm, I'm, oh, what about the doctrine? Oh, it's not about doctrine. Well, then get over it. <laughs> One thing we learn about is we learn to what? Love each other and appreciate each other because of our differences. Now, that doesn't mean the Lord doesn't lead some to other churches. He does. Fine. I meet people and I say, you know, I want to just say how much and we're at so and so and we're growing and we're involved there. And that's fine. That's, you have to be where the Lord wants you. Some of you came from other churches to here. That's fine. Uh, but I have had some church leaders tell me, you know, sometimes the people from Indian Hills are just a problem here. Um, you know, they, they're so critical in their. Well, that's not it. If you're there because you, this is where the Lord wants you, then build that work. Um, that's servants through whom you believed. As the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Uh, they're just carrying out what the Lord has directed. It's taking the truth of God, um, explaining it, applying it. Uh, that's the goal. Uh, servants through whom you believe. That's what Paul says. That's what Paul is. Oh, I was saved through Apollos. Oh, that's fine. Saved how? Well, through faith in the death and resurrection of Christ. Oh. So all Paul was was a servant or a slave. All Apollos was was a servant to bring you the truth. But you really were identified with Jesus Christ. Your faith in him and his death and his burial and his resurrection. He died for you. Well, yes, of course. Well, then what are you all wrapped up with Apollos for? Or Paul or Peter or they're all telling you that. Well, yeah, but I think Apollos really did it so much more eloquently and clearly and helpfully than Paul did it. Oh, that's nice. What you're really saying is what? 
the Spirit of God used Apollos in your life in a great way. Thank the Lord for Apollos, sir. That's fine. But that doesn't mean now we got the Apollos faction or the Paul faction or whatever. As the Lord gave to each one. Verse uh, 6. I planted, Apollos watered. God was causing the growth. You know, that's what the Lord gave to each one. God was causing the growth. The end of verse 7, but God causes the growth. Uh, Each of these are simply servants that God has provided. He took Paul out of the church at Corinth, sent him on his way. He brought Apollos in. Not so you could decide now we could have a division, whether it's Paul and Apollos or that's just an example, but it's the fraction uh, dividing among men. Oh, wait a minute. Are we presenting a different Christ? Are we presenting a different... uh, Who caused the growth? I planted, Apollos watered. Oh. Okay. I I, I appreciate Apollos. He's, He's my kind of guy. Uh, he watered. I, I, I really, wait, who caused the growth? Who saved you to begin with? Who's enabled you to grow? It's all the work of God. God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. He puts it here and as clear as he can. It was God causing growth the growth. So the one who plants, that's fine. The one who waters, that's fine. Those are all important. They're distinct roles. They're distinct responsibilities. All the gifts that Paul's going to talk about, they all contribute in one way or the other, but it's all said and done. Without the work of God, nothing happens. I mean, I could preach till I'm Blue in the face till I'm 140. And what? Nothing happens. Unless God takes his word and uses it to transform a heart by drawing that person to faith in Christ. And then the person is nurtured in the word and they grow. But we have people who have sat under this, in this church, under my ministry for years. And I think they're probably never really truly born again. What did I accomplish in their life? I mean, they were confirmed in their lostness, but only God can save a soul. I mean, that's the point. God caused the growth. Uh, It's God doing the work. It was the end of verse 6, I planted Apollos water. God was causing the growth. The end of verse 7, God causes the growth. Neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. Um, It puts it in perspective. Uh, I'm nothing. Well, well, this church depends on me, you know. I, uh, you know, I've I've been here for many years, and uh, you know, I've taught the word, and uh, yeah, you'll either be my follower or, well. You'll take whatever comes. Uh, Well, wait a minute. What am I? I mean, there are people who have labored more diligently than I have and been more faithful than I have, and they've seen not a handful of people come to know Christ and grow to maturity. And that, verse 6, I planted Apollos water. God was causing the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. Oh, well, I thought, you know, I was a Paul man. I was an Apollos man. Well, they're just one. They're both servants of the same God. So how are you dividing among them and them? Each will, each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Uh, you know, 
we measure success, and we don't like to say it, but the world's standards influence us. I'm successful because the church has grown. Someone else, well, they've labored and they poured their life into ministry, but they just had a handful of people. Well, what? Because I am important and they are less. Oh, wait, who caused the growth? Oh, God. Well, of course, God. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, he used me. He used that person. He used the person who, you know, we look at the prophets and they're prophets who are killed. They're prophets who have a long ministry. The, is your faithful doing what God calls you to do? Uh, we have one task. We serve one God if we are in this together. He who plants and he who waters are one. One. But each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now, you know, the word labor, toil, it doesn't, it's not measurable. I don't know. You know, when the rewards are given out, may find that person who labored and toiled and gave everything they could as they taught the word, but God wasn't using it to change lives and hearts. But they will be rewarded for their labor, not for their success. Uh, I can take credit, but ultimately, God bestows the credit. All I did was teach the word, and I couldn't, you know, I remember being asked years ago, the church was growing, all the seats were full, we were putting in metal chairs in the aisles. I said, I don't know. I just get up and tell people to turn in their Bible to this passage, and we teach it, and they keep pouring in. Um, why? Because God was doing something. But someone else was as faithful or more faithful with the word and God wasn't doing the same thing in lies. What does that mean? It means he was faithful. Labor, his labor, his labor. Each will receive, verse 8, his own reward according to his own labor. Not according to his own success. His own labor. So I'm faithful with the gifts God's given me. I'm using it to the ultimate end. This is where the church, and we're seeing it in the United States. We're seeing it in the world, but in, in, we're here in the United States. We constantly are under pressure. And the subtle change is, well, we'll be less emphasis on the word because we have more success, because we get more people. Oh, wait a minute. What are we called to do? What if God is done with his work? Well, gee, I hope a new pastor's going to fill these empty seats. I hope so too, if that's what God is doing. If not, I hope he doesn't. But one thing we do is we pray that the man will be faithful with the word and it may continue to shrink or it may grow. I don't know. Each labor. Uh, God will receive, each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 8. Uh, kapos, that's a word. It means toil, labor. Uh, people have gone to the mission field or gone to difficult places and they've labored and they've taught the word and nothing happens. Well, you know, if I had been there, they probably would have had something happen. Probably not. Uh, if I was faithful with the word and God wasn't doing what he's doing now, I don't know. Um, you know, we're going to move toward the tribulation and that seven-year period before the coming of Christ and people are going to die for teaching the word. All they're going to do is be faithful with their labor. We are God's fellow workers. We are God's fellow workers. Don't want to lose sight of who we are. Uh, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Uh, put this in perspective. I am just a worker. 
You are God's field. You are God's building. You are our, all the credit goes to him. All I am is a fellow worker, a, you know, one that he's using. But you're God's building. You're God's field. That puts it in perspective. I am a worker serving the living God. You are God's field, God's building. I just have to be careful to be faithful with what he's called me to do in ministering to you. That's the key. Um, Everything is God's. It's not mine. Well, what's going to happen to my church? What's my church in the sense I belong here, like you belong here? Um, But ultimately, it's God's building. It's God's field. He determines what's going to happen here. We don't. We pray for one another. We pray for the ministry. But ultimately, God decides. Let me uh, wrap this up by bringing uh, several points to you from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Just the last part of what we've talked about, verses 5 to 9. First point. The Lord gives certain, certain, certain servants to be instruments through whom some come to faith in Christ. Uh, that was in uh, chapter 3, verse 5. Uh, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed. God chooses. Uh, why? I don't know. I mean, it's because God's chosen to do that work. I was blessed to be here. I was blessed to preach the word. I remember thinking, oh, Lord, when we were having, when I came, we were having 60 people, uh, 33 adults. Lord, if we could get to 250, wow, that would be great because then if we had a family or two that move away, we'd still have a stable group. But the Lord did much more. Oh, that's just because (laughs) he said, well, that kind of preaching, I got to do more. No, had nothing to do with that because all I did was open the word and say, here's the word. There are people in places in this country and around the world that did that for their whole life and didn't see a fraction of what we saw. So what am I? The Lord gives certain servants to be instruments to whom some come to faith. Paul preached uh, in Athens far as we know there was no church established and no church recorded in Athens but uh, you know he went on to Corinth and there was I don't know it's God's doing secondly God's servants have differing responsibilities it God who produces the growth that's verse 6 I planted Apollos watered God was causing the growth I want to be careful because the world comes up with well if we put these two together And we think, well, we mix things, then we cancel out the effectiveness. And Paul talked about that uh, back in chapter 1 and into chapter 2, that uh, then it's not God's work any longer. I mean, we can get 100,000 people at a football game. If you're going to say Gil's preaching, probably not going to get 100,000 people out. Uh, so we want to be careful. We think, well, we, we mix and then we work in the gospel, but we cancel the effectiveness of the message when we mix it with men's ideas. So God's servants have differing responsibilities. It's God who causes the growth. Number three, it is not the servants who are significant, but God who causes the growth. I mean, it's very simple. I am a servant. I came here 50 plus years ago and uh, there were 60 people. I was a servant. I preached the word. The spirit of God did what he and he alone could do with the word in lives. And the work grew. Oh, I'll take credit for that. Who gets the credit? There are men who have been preaching the word faithfully for many years and they have uh, 
very little to show, but it's their labor that will be rewarded. Uh, that's the key. They were faithful, and they'll be rewarded for their faithfulness. Oh, I thought, well, I guess I'll get a big reward because I had a bigger church. No. Uh, may find out this person who labored and they said, well, he wasn't much, very successful, but he taught the word, but nobody got saved, uh, hardly anybody, and hardly anybody was growing, but he was faithful. He labored. I want to uh, emphasize that uh, point four. We're going to six in case you're wondering where this is going. We're going to point four. All God's servants work together to one end. The beginning of verse eight. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. We have different gifts, different responsibilities. But we're all working together to one end. I mean, we don't work and say, well, I get credit for this and you get credit for that and you get, we're all one. We're just servants. And, you know, it ought to be clear. Servants are given different responsibility. Their faithfulness depends on what they're given to do. That's all. I mean, I have to be faithful with what God gives me to do. Um, that's, um, we all work to one end because we want to honor the God that we serve. Now, we want to be careful because when we begin to develop the world's methods, then we begin to go to the world, then we begin to work the world into the church, and then pretty soon we just have a secular organization under the title church, which is what we call liberal churches today. They don't really uh, preach and teach the truths of God's word, but, you know, they may be large, they may do a lot of things, quote, good things that the world appreciates, but they are not servants of the living God. Verse 5, uh, number 5, rewards will be given to servants according to their toil, not their success. That's the end of verse 8. Each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. That's it. Each one. So... We all are serving the one God. But each one, so it, there is a point. I have to be careful. Each of us, we have a multiplicity of gifts here. But each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. You know, I'm the most prominent in the congregation. But that doesn't mean I get the biggest reward. We're rewarded according to faithfulness with our labor. Uh, how faithful are you in the area God's given you? There are people here, they're faithful, and they, they don't get the recognition. I get all this recognition and all this honor, but what does he say? Each will receive his own reward according to his own labor, not according to his own success, not according to his own... Um, how did he grind it out? That's keep that in mind it puts it in perspective it doesn't matter whether I get recognized here and now it will all be dealt with before the beam of seat number six the workers and the church all belong to God verse nine we are God's fellow workers you are God's field God's building so all I am is a worker serving the living God. You're God's field. You're God's building. That's what matters. You're God's field, God's building. I am simply doing the task that God has given me. Um, you are fulfilling the task God has given you. Oh yeah, but I don't get the, well, we're not talking about human recognition here. We're talking about faithfulness. We're talking about labor. We're talking about toil. I mean, I think, oh, we have people who have faithfully labored and toiled, and they'll get almost no real recognition. They're just faithful, and this work grows and goes because of the contributions they make. Right. 
they're concerned, oh, this is what God has given me to do. I want to do it to the best of my ability. I'm doing it for him, and we're back to, you know, this all is tied to what he covered in the first couple of uh, chapters on the focus on the cross. In chapter 2, verse 2, Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. You know, I, it wasn't me. All I did was come and tell you the message that God had entrusted to me. And the spirit of God used it to transform your life. I don't get any credit for that as far as human, uh, humanly speaking. You oughtn't to be following me. I mean, I just came and told you what Christ did. Um, And God used it. So the workers, the church, it all is God's. So all I have to do is be faithful where God has put me in what God has called me to do. And he'll do the rewarding. And... As he says, each man must be careful, as he'll pick up in verse 10. Um, That's what we're all about. So thank God for bringing us together. Thank God for the history we have. Thank God for the present we have. And thank God for the future. Because it is God's work using the people where he has put them. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your truth. Thank you for the riches of your word. Lord, we want to be careful. We want to learn from the letter to the church at Corinth. We want to be those who are careful to heed the word of the Spirit, the truth. Thank you for this congregation, the faithfulness of so many in so many ways, in so many areas, who labor. Lord, it is for your glory, your honor. All that is accomplished is a testimony of the working of the power of your spirit. And we give you praise. Thank you for bringing us together today to look into your word. Pray for the rest of the day. Pray for the evening, the various events going on. They all will be used to accomplish the work that only you can do in lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.